uh, to the law school, our alum, Robert, who is the commissioner of baseball, and Robert Manfred, who has been the commissioner now for one full year. Right. So we should all applaud him. He's finished his inaugural year. Uh, about Robert Manfred, whose background as a lawyer included being a partner in a law firm after being an associate, being a law, law clerk for a wonderful judge, Judge Toro, here in uh, Massachusetts. And then he did get involved in labor and labor disputes and somehow got involved with baseball. And so we'll hear more about that. But finding out where your career can go and how you can't predict it is going to be one of the things here, as well as where the ball goes. And the last thing I want to say is, it is one of Yogi Berra's sayings, I just can't resist saying, that baseball is 90% mental and 50% physical. <laughs> so let's have some mental work here. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks. To everyone for coming, thank you so much to the commissioner for taking time to do this. This is definitely one of the high points of my law teaching career. Uh, so the format is I'll ask questions for maybe 20 or 25 minutes about half the time and then we'll invite questions from the audience. Um, I'll let you know when I'm nearly done asking questions. So I, I don't actually see microphones. How, do, how are we doing that in this room? Sure. So you'll walk around. So should I get people to form two? Stand up and say it. Just stand up, okay. All right, so and I'll let you know when I've reached my last question or so, so you can start thinking about your questions. Um, please ask a question, don't make a speech. Please keep the question brief because then we can get more questions. And let's just stipulate in advance how appreciative we are of the commissioner for spending his time with us this afternoon so everyone won't have to say that and maybe we can get another question or two in. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna mostly ask questions about baseball, okay. but I have to start out with a career question. So I noticed that we actually graduated from law school in the same year, 1983, and I almost went to Harvard, but I ended up choosing Stanford because I thought the weather would be better, which for the record it is. Um, <laughs> and as far as I can remember, I never became baseball commissioner or even got close to it. So I'm sort of wondering what I did wrong and what you did right. <laughs> how, do you go from, how do you go from being a Harvard Law School graduate to being commissioner of baseball? Well, um, you know, I think the, the word that was most important probably in my career was ERISA. Okay, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> Um, I was practicing law in Washington, a big labor and employment practice at Morgan Lewis, and um, I was assigned to this horrible ERISA case. Um, we represented a big pension fund, the Teamsters Central States Fund, and I spent literally months going through old documents about what Jimmy Hoffa had done and not done in terms of his investments. And the partner, about halfway through the case, the partner that was assigned or who was responsible for the client. Um, was retained by baseball uh, to be their labor counsel. So as you might expect, um, his interest in this mess in Chicago waned, um, and I was sort of left with this case. Um, we, we eventually lost in the district court, and then uh, <laughs> um, won on appeal in the 11th Circuit. And after I, I argued the case, we got a result, and the guy came to me and said, do you have any interest, the partner who had um, been retained said you have any interest in doing baseball work so um, I was the young associate um, on the baseball account my first negotiation was um, 1989 1990 when we locked the players out I basically drafted contract language and took notes in the bargaining sessions but did get to go to all of them which was quite an experience um, and then um, became, that's where I met 
my predecessor, Commissioner Seelig. He at the time was the head of the Player Relations Committee, which was the labor arm. Um, we formed a relationship. I kind of stayed on the account um, through the long strike in 1994. Uh, they tried to hire me a couple of times during that period of time to come in-house, and um, it was a very unstable time in baseball, and I wasn't willing to leave the firm. Um, eventually, the partner whose client it was got fired by baseball. It became my client, um, and I stayed in that role for three or four years. And then when Commissioner Seelig went from being interim commissioner to permanent commissioner, I decided to go in-house as the labor guy. I said to Martha on the way over here, uh, it was probably a bad career decision. Nobody had ever, ever lasted in that labor job more than five years. It was sort of a terminal position. And you know, when you look at people's careers who had the job, there's some really good people. It had a way of, um, it was a career ending job for a lot of people, let me put it that way. Uh, you know, and uh, fortunately, fortunately, in no small part because of another, another Harvard Law School alum, Mike Wiener, who was the head of the Players Association, uh, we found a way to make three deals that, you know, kept baseball on the field, I think improved our economics. Proved it more for some clubs than others, um, but um, I see my friends here smiling from the Red Sox. But um, um, you know, <laughs> and um, you know, I eventually became COO. Um, labor is interesting in professional sports; it gives you a very broad access to the economics of the game because the, you know your product is your labor, so you, it's a broader function than it is if you work for General Motors. Um, I eventually became COO. I had that job only 18 months and then, you know, got elected. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but I did. Um, Great. Um, okay, so uh, some baseball questions. One of your big decisions in the first year had to do with whether to reinstate Pete Rose. Um, for those who are too young to remember, Pete Rose was one of the great baseball players of all time, certainly of the 60s and 70s. Uh, but he was barred from baseball, in, I guess, in the 1980s, late right. 1980s, maybe. For, yep. for he wagered on baseball when he was a player manager in the in the early to mid 1980s. And you had the question of whether to reinstate him, which would, I suppose, make him eligible for the Hall of Fame in some sense. Right. Can you talk some about what the factors were in that decision? I can. Um, I'm really glad. There's only one Cincinnati hat in the room. It's always a good sign when you're talking about <laughs> Pete Rose. Um, <laughs> I think the most important thing is um, something I actually learned when I was clerking and I, I've used it um, in my business career extensively um, when I've had difficult decisions. Judge Toro used to say, the judge I clerked for, you know, you, you got to focus on what you're supposed to be deciding. And that's really where I started with Pete Rose. Um, the fundamental responsibility of the Commissioner of Baseball under the Major League Constitution is to protect the integrity of the game. Um, if I had um, decided to reinstate Mr. Rose, he could have, and I submit to you, probably would have been hired by a club in a role where he would have interacted with players and um, potentially present a risk to the integrity of the game. Um, it is not my job to determine what the eligibility rules are for the Hall of Fame or whether or not they should be changed or whether or not Mr. Rose should be eligible. Um, that's the Hall of Fame, for those of you who don't know, is an institution completely separate from Major League Baseball. It has its own set of rules. That body decided to follow our permanent in eligibility list as their eligibility test. But that was, in my view, somebody else's responsibility. So I, I began the process by focusing on uh, the charge uh, that's laid out in the Major League Constitution, trying to pay the most attention to the issue um, that was my responsibility. And in the course of the um, conversation that went on with Mr. Rose, it became clear to me that, could, because he told me, um, that he still bet on baseball. And um, he bet legally. Um, he, he was really clear that he didn't bet illegally. But given his history and given his desire to be reinstated in the game, um, I felt that 
um, his inability to stay away from that behavior presented a risk that, uh, to the game that I did not find to be acceptable. Right. Um, since Pete Rose leads to a discussion about the Hall of Fame, I, I did have another question, and I realize you're not voting on the Hall of Fame, and I don't mean to put you on a spot, but I'm curious about what your position would be if you were voting on someone like Barry Bonds or Roger Clemens, two of the great players who don't seem like they're going to make it into the Hall of Fame because of the allegations of, of drug use? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, there are character provisions in the Hall of Fame rules. I mean, it, 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 there are it, it, criteria that are set out and character and fair play are, are mentioned prominently in those rules. So I understand um, why some writers have reacted the way they have to, to, to players um, who have been found to use performance enhancing drugs. Um, the only thing that I've said publicly about this topic is it's up to the writers, in my view, to make a judgment about somebody who tested positive or was otherwise proved to have used performance enhancing drugs. Um, what I have been unspoken, uh, outspoken about is um, writers who seem to make judgments about players based on their appearance, even though they never tested positive, even though all those little investigators that now work for me in New York are out there trying to prove things. We, it, you can't, um, and, and you know, I ran these programs for a very long time, you cannot tell a steroid user from a non-steroid user based on what they look like. It's just not possible. So I, I think it is unfair uh, for writers, and if you look at the voting and the numbers of some of these players, I think there are players who never tested positive, were never proven to use PEDs, that have been penalized by writers because they think they know the player used performance enhancing drugs. And that piece, I really do believe, is wrong. Right. Um, so I have a, a question that sort of um, asks about comparing well, comparing developments in different sports. So I'm mostly a baseball fan, but I go to a lot of Celtics games, and it's hard to, it's hard to not notice what a youth-friendly place it is. So there's so many kids, and they're all competing to get on the jumbotron and the dancing and the gymnasts and the, the loud noise. And Red Sox games seem different to me, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how much you're concerned that baseball is, in some sense, less attractive to young people, whether that's true and whether you can do anything about it. Well, we are concerned um, uh, about the issue of young people in the game. Um, you know, we think we have a great product. We think we have a, a really family-friendly product, which is a huge advantage for us. Um, but I think there, there are places where we probably underinvested in the last couple of decades. The, the, the single um, most important determinant of fan avidity as an adult is whether the young person, man or woman, played the game as a kid. That, that it's the single strongest determinant. And um, I think baseball and softball have not been as competitive in the youth space um, a, a, as they should have been uh, during that period of time. Um, you know, there used to be when you're 58 years old like me, you played baseball in the spring because that's what they offered you. I mean, that, that was it. Um, now it's lacrosse, it's soccer, and it's the desire of coaches to have athletes specialize at a very early age that affect participation rates. So we have um, devoted a tremendous amount of time and energy to an initiative that we refer to as play ball. Um, we're working with all sorts of groups in the youth space. Um, Cal Ripken joined this effort as a special advisor. Um, we announced that at the winter meetings. For those of you who don't know, Cal is a major player in the youth space. I mean, he runs his own leagues, um, has his own uh, a, a approach to encouraging participation. But we've tried to do things that are much broader than just working with youth leagues. For example, we, have, we had a great partnership with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. I went out to San Francisco last spring, gave a speech, came back with 140 pledges from mayors who had play ball events in their cities in the, during the month of August. And these play ball, ball events are an effort to get back to the way kids used to play baseball. Not nine on nine uniforms, umpires screaming parents, but it's more sandlot, low key, wiffle ball, all those small games 
um, that I think are so important to building a love of the game. And then the last piece of it is we've made a tremendous effort um, to encourage play in underserved areas. Um, we have six active urban youth academies around the country that our clubs and Major League Baseball run together, encourage youth play um, in areas where baseball was not being played. We have three more on the drawing board. Our goal is to have one in every Major League city. Um, and we also have a grassroots program in the inner cities called uh, RBI, Reviving Baseball in the Inner City. So we're working really hard at participation. The second biggest determinant um, of fan avidity is the age at which you go to the ballpark the first time, okay? So I, I haven't looked at these numbers in over a year because we've been trying to fix these numbers, but it, close enough. The difference in the number of live games you consume as an adult in a year um, is dramatic depending on whether you went to your first game at age seven or you went to your first game at age 11. I mean, literally that small window makes a huge difference in terms of avidity. So people, and look, remember I sit in a office building in New York. Um, what really happens in baseball happens at our 30 clubs. So clubs like the Red Sox, what was your tagline calling all kids last year? Was it dedicated their entire season to, to the effort to attract parents to bring parents, grandparents, to bring their kids to the ballpark. Um, they had a separate entrance. Um, they had all sorts of activities pre and post game for kids. My favorite piece of it, they actually built a room where um, parents could take kids during the game for a little break. You know, you could face paint, video games, whatever, so that you don't run into the phenomenon where there are three innings, we spent all this money, and then we got to leave because juniors are having a fit, right? It gives you a chance to, you know, break up the day, stay in the ballpark, and teach kids to love the game. So we're working really hard on this, this youth initiative, and, um, you know, we're hopeful over the long haul it'll, it'll really bear fruit for us. Right. So um, the next question you might already have touched on, so I don't know if you have more to say it or, about it or not. So all, again, from observing the Jumbotron at Celtics games, it's really noticeable how racially diverse the crowd is. And it just doesn't seem the same way at Fenway Park. And I know mm -hmm. baseball's concerned about that. Mm -hmm. what? Yeah, look, um, we think it begins with the product on the field. Um, w one thing that, um, I, I do think it's important to get out there. You know, lots of stories get written about our diversity, okay? First of all, we are probably the most diverse professional sport. Unfortunately, people tend to think about African-American diversity and Latino diversity with respect to us as separate. But, you know, it is diversity, okay? So you gotta begin there. If you take out our foreign-born players, okay, um, our African-American players are about 11% of the major leagues, which roughly lines up with the population in the United States. Um, but there is a widely held perception out there that you know the number of African-Americans in the game has decreased and therefore we have less diversity. So what are we doing about it? Well, I talked about the urban youth academies, reviving baseball in the inner cities. The key to this is you know getting kids playing. Um, interestingly, our, my, the, this, the amateur draft in June was my first one. So, you know, you remember all of your firsts in this job and you remember the little facts about them. 25% of the players selected in the first round were African American last year. So we're making progress on this and we do believe presenting that broadly diverse game um, to our fans will bring more diversity in terms of audiences. I, I shouldn't just talk about African Americans, however. Um, there's only 12, I believe, um, Mexican players in the big leagues last year. And, you know, we actually, despite the fact that we're heavily Latino, we actually under-index in the Hispanic market in the United States. And the reason for that is the mismatch between the Caribbean players, largely, that we have and the Hispanic population in the United States that's largely Mexico, so, uh, Mexican. So Mexico is another huge um, focus for us. Um, I, 
Mr. Courtney, one of my colleagues, and I went down to Culiacan um, this past summer, uh, met with the two Mexican professional leagues. We're working very hard to get more Mexican professionals out of Mexico. Those of you who know something about the history of the Mexican leagues know that um, they have been, I want to be polite here, um, they have tended to hoard their players. They have not been open to the idea of letting them come here and return to Mexico and play if they want to. So we're, we're working hard with the professional leagues and we're actually going to play a couple of games in uh, Mexico City during March. Great. Um, so one of the things that's really noticeable in the last few years is the parity that baseball has achieved and maybe 15 or 20 years ago I think Mm -hmm. Yankees were in the World Series six out of eight years, which we could probably all agree is not a very good thing. Um, it would be fine if it were the Red Sox, but with the Yankees. Um, and I, I'm wondering both for an explanation for why the Astros and the Royals and the Pirates are doing so well, and I assume that's a really good thing for baseball, that you're happy with that. How do you oh, we, oh, I mean, look, we, we sell competition. That, that, that's what we sell, right? It's what we got. Um, and so competitive balance is really crucial. And, you know, um, I... I don't want to diminish the great efforts that the Red Sox make here, but the Red Sox are going to do just fine, okay? Um, when you're not competitive in Milwaukee or Kansas City, it hurts you. It hurts your business. It hurts the sport. So competitive balance is really an important thing. Um, the, the single issue that I thought most about when I took this job, uh, when I took my original job with baseball, the labor job, um, and probably the one that was most responsible for us being able to make agreements was how to deal with baseball's economics, which are really, really different from the economics of the other sports. Okay, Every other sport has a cap. Um, you know, caps are great, right? You got a minimum, you got a maximum. If you kind of regulate the dollars, right? Everybody's playing in the same ballpark, right? And, you know, you get competitive balance. Our problem was we didn't have a cap. We had a very strong union um, that didn't want a cap. Um, and, and we had a level of revenue disparity in the game because so much of baseball's revenue is generated locally as opposed to the NFL, which, you know, for example, huge central TV dollars that are equally shared. Uh, we had so much revenue sharing that a cap really wouldn't have worked in baseball even if we had gotten there. And why is that? A cap is just nothing but a minimum and a maximum, right? Um, minimum payroll, maximum payroll. The problem in baseball, to get to any reasonable share with the players, we would have had a minimum salary that was so high that for probably 10 of our markets, they would have needed massive revenue sharing. Far more, far more revenue sharing than the large market clubs were willing or, and quite frankly, should have been willing to spend because you know, they had paid much more for their asset in a large market. They didn't want to just give their money away to small markets. So we knew a cap wasn't going to work, and we had to figure out another way to get to competitive balance. And so because I'm not all that bright, um, I knew the big fix, a salary cap, wasn't going to work. So it seemed to me that it had to be some combination of other less restrictive economic alternatives. So what's in that bag, right? What's in there? Well, we got a luxury tax on the very highest payroll clubs. Um, that tax, while it doesn't prevent you from going over, it does dampen your incentive to go over and it creates a pool of money that you can use for other things if clubs do go, clubs like the Red Sox do go over. Um, that's more acceptable to the union because it's not an absolute bar. It's better for the clubs because a soft cap at the top without a, an aggregate spending commitment, you don't need the minimum. So you're out of the minimum problem, right? So that's step one. Um, revenue sharing. Look, we move, the first revenue sharing deal that got made 
and I was in the middle of it in 1994, was for $50 million to move. That's what was supposed to move from top to bottom, 50 million bucks. We now move four, sometimes four, sometimes $450 million a year. And there are only, what is it? I know you know, 11 payors, is that right, 12? So, you know, it's a huge give for those 12, essentially what you got, 11 or 12 payors, some people who are kind of in the middle, not much happens there, and then you got a group of payees at the bottom that, that is larger, larger than the 12 that, that, that are writing the checks. So um, we made massive progress on the, the issue of revenue sharing. Um, the third piece, no one quite understands is something called the debt service rule. Um, the debt service rule we sold to the union um, on the theory that, it, that it, it, it's essentially a coverage ratio. It requires the club to have enough EBITDA with a certain multiple to, to pay the, the debt obligations that they have. Why is that relevant? Well, it, it induced financial stability in the game, okay? And when you have um, when you get fa financial stability in a professional sport, it usually means it brings some modicum of payroll restraint with it, okay? So that was the third piece. And then the last and maybe the most important one in the game today is, the, and we didn't get this until 2011, the reform of the Amateur Talent Acquisition System in baseball, uh, where we essentially got to a slotting system in the Amateur Draft has been huge. Huge because what it does, it is it assures not only that the worst club gets the first pick in the draft the next year, but it assures that they get the first pick at a price that they can afford. Um, so you know we cobbled these various things together. They came in over a series of agreements, and they have produced a really good economic result for us. I mean, it's really extraordinary because I can remember only two or three years ago, Houston whose payroll I think was in the mid 20 millions right. and was just a doormat. And it's kind of unfair because other teams in their division pay them, play them 19 times. Right. And now they're a couple outs from the ALCS game. That's, that, that's correct. I mean, they did a phenomenal job. And, and, and look, young talent, um, everything that happens in the game is related, right? If you think about the teams that won in the late 90s, they were essentially veteran teams. Um, so. What's happened since then? Why? And then you look at the teams that are winning now, the really good teams, the Mets, the Cubs, right? Kansas City, they're young teams, okay? Why is that? Well, it's a lot of reasons. You know, amateur baseball's different. College baseball's a hell of a lot better than it was 20 years ago. And the one, you know, we don't talk about very much is that in the late 90s, the veteran makeup of those clubs was influenced by the prevalence of performance-enhancing drugs in the game. You might say, you know, if you think about it, you know it's true. Um, and, you know, cleaning up the game has also accentuated that progression to young talent. So I'm just going to ask one more question. People in the audience who have questions should be ready to go after this. And I think I've gotten really long answers so far, haven't you? I'm no, the sorry answers about are great. That. <laughs> um, I think I forgot to mention when I started. We're going to stop right at 12:50. I know some people have classes at one, so 12:50 we'll put a hard stop to the to the event. Uh, the last question has to do with uh, again developments in in basketball and football. It's notable in the last couple of years, uh, female umpires, female assistant coaches. I'm wondering how, base, how close baseball is to that, whether that's something that's of concern. Yeah, you know, it is of concern. You know, it, it, it gets back to, I, I'm a, it's funny for a lawyer. Um, in a business setting, um, the most, imp I have always believed the most important thing for you to have to make good business decisions is data, right? You have to understand what's out there from a quantitative perspective. And all of the studies, about entertainment spending, and we are in the entertainment business, that's what we're, is that women drive entertainment decisions, particularly for families. And so, you know, again, females is another form of diversity that is really, really important to us. Um, we had a, a woman who was hired into a coaching position with the A's, correct, Pat? Yeah, with the A's this year. Um, it, you know, we've made a real effort to reach out um, to softball, which we see as, you know, a sister game um, for us, but it's, it is a really important area. I would have told you um, 
you know, five years ago that I would never see the day, you'd never see the day where you'd see a woman play a professional sport. Um, the very first thing I did after I was elected in August of 2014 was go to the Little League World Series. And for those of you who pay attention to such things, that was the Monet Davis year. And I'll tell you, it put aside just an incredible young woman. I mean, just unbelievable. Um, when you saw her compete against boys her own age, you know, you have to, you, you sort of stop and think, you know, this is not impossible. Kind of interesting, Fox has in, I should, probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyways, Fox has in development a series about the first woman to make it to the major leagues. So, you know, there's a lot of interest in this topic. And I think, you know, you, can't, you know, other than as a place kicker in football, it's hard to imagine, right? I think in our sport, it's not impossible over the long haul. So I'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, you want me to call on people or are you? Okay, go ahead. Hi, Jonathan Rosenluth, proud Blue Jays fan. Um, <laughs> With the Canadian dollar dropping significantly over the past year, um, it influences the competitive balance in the AL East. Is there anything that Major League Baseball is doing to equate for that? Should Major League Baseball be doing something? Thank you. Yeah, um, look, let's start with what Toronto has as assets. Um, there's this whole country called Canada. <laughs> <laughs> And they have it as a television territory, which is something uh, of an advantage, number one. Number two, they're owned by um, Rogers Communications. And, you know, there's this new thing that large companies like Rogers understand very well. They're called currency hedges. And um, particularly when you have a business that straddles, um, you know, the U.S. and Canada, um, it, most sophisticated businesses use those hedges in order to, to deal with variations. Having said that, um, there's also a third thing that is um, referred to as the Commissioner's Discretionary Fund. It is a pool of money um, that's part of the revenue sharing system um, that in the last, I will get my years wrong, the last time the Canadian dollar got very weak, Commissioner Selig used that fund in order to help Toronto through at least the transition of that currency um, devaluation. So, you know, we, we, we do worry uh, about that topic. It's particularly difficult with a franchise where they're taking in Canadian dollars. And remember, they gotta pay their guys in American dollars. So it is a, it, it's a real issue. I make light of it at the beginning, but um, you know, it's a real issue and we have done things in the past to deal with it. Um, we'll see how this one unfolds. I can't see everybody. Um, the Cincinnati Reds fan. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, the hat helped me out. Um, Cody Rutowski, obviously, Reds fan. I will say that I'm happy with your Pete Rose decision, but that makes me a minority. You may be the only one in Cincinnati. <laughs> Quite possibly. Um, but what I wanted to ask about was, uh, I guess, investigations like the Roldis Chapman, the Yasuo Puig investigation. Not asking you to comment on them specifically. Um, but I'm just kind of wondering what kind of standard you're looking at or the league's looking at and how they structure those investigations because I think the league has said that they're willing to withhold the ability to find liability, even absent criminal liability. So That's correct. Um, well, let me say a couple of things. That <laughs> there was no such thing as investigative capacity when I arrived at baseball. That we, didn't, we just, we didn't, you know, we had a security department, but really what the security department did was try to keep players out of trouble. I mean, they didn't investigate players. They sort of, you know, they're like fixers, you know, to make sure that, you know, they didn't get worse than it was. Um, you know, we have a really aggressive and talented um, investigative group now. Um, we started out with former law enforcement people. We actually, a couple of years ago, went out and hired um, a former U.S. attorney to head the group. Um, there are many more lawyers involved. We did that um, because of some of the things we learned about who was most effective where um, in, in the investigative realm. Probably the most important thing there is, you know, investigators turn up lots and lots of information. 
much of which you can't use, even in an arbitration as opposed to a hearing. Lawyers have a way of focusing investigators on evidence that you might actually use in a hearing. And, and you know, we learned those lessons slowly. Um, the domestic violence area is a really, really difficult one. Um, societally, and let me talk about society first and then us. You know, look, most cases, I'm not saying this is a good, this is a fact, do not end up in prosecution because prosecutors find themselves in a situation where the victim, for whatever set of reasons, decides, I'm not going to testify. And absent, you know, a third party witness, you don't have evidence that will allow you to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, the reason we reserved in our policy the ability to proceed even absent a criminal conviction is twofold. First and most important, for some reason, for some reason, the general public expects us to do more than law enforcement does. They do. I, I'm not, that is a very heavy burden for us. It really is a heavy, because remember, we don't have police power, the ability to issue a warrant. That, you know, we don't have any of that. But they expect more, and given that expectation, we felt we needed to, to reserve that right. Um, I think that um, the most important thing that I'm thinking about going forward, I mean, obviously, I want to be fair and make sure I understand the facts to the extent that we can get at them and, and have all the facts. And I want to be fair. But I also think it's important for us as an institution to make a statement about what we think about this topic. And, you know, I hope that um, we'll be able to do that. Uh, Bill Alford here. Thanks. So uh, another lifetime Red Sox fan with Professor Klarman. So I wonder if you could say a, a little more about your affirmative strategy for uh, globalizing the sport. Uh, you've obviously mentioned Mexico and Canada. Another commissioner, commissioner of the China Professional Baseball League in Taiwan, is also a Harvard Law School graduate. Okay. Thanks. You know, well, uh, you, you know, Pat, I noticed if you came up here 15 years ago, all these Red Sox fans are like drop, downtrodden people. Now they're all these happy people, you know? I mean, it, it, they're all happy people now. I don't know why that is, but... Uh, 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 uh. Anyways, just an observation, not being here every day. Um, we... It, it, I have a passel of Harvard Law School graduates around me, um, including our general counsel, chief legal officer, our chief operating officer, and our head of strategy. Um, as a matter of fact, our head of strategy is the only lawyer I ever hired fresh out of law school. He's done, he was with us, went to McKinsey for a while, came back, went to Facebook for a while, and then I brought him back as head of strategy. Um, when he came back, shortly after he came back, our uh, international um, person, senior vice president international, left. And we asked, um, the gentleman's name is Chris Park, we asked Chris to uh, take over the international business because we felt the most important thing that had to happen um, was that we took a fresh look at our strategy internationally. So um, I can't say enough um, about how talented um, this young man is. And um, the first thing he, he did uh, was he came back after about a week and he said, you know, I think the, really the problem with you guys is you've always tried to have an international strategy. And as a result, you jumped the tracks at step one. You know, you, you really just, you're headed the wrong direction. And he said, the real point is that we need to identify markets that are significant to us, and we have to have localized strategies for each of those markets. So l let me give you um, an example. Uh, for a number of years, we have, uh, we've actually played in China. We have two full-time baseball schools in an effort to you know, generate some play from the ground up. Um, there is a professional league in Taiwan. Um, China has participated in the World Baseball Classic. I've been to China. Um, starting from the ground up 
is a really daunting undertaking because there's lots of ground there. Um, and um, I think that those efforts had evolved to the point that he came to us and said, you know, we need to, we're not going to make money on or money that matters, let me put it that way, on this, but we need to get our content available in China. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to, he says to me, I'm going to ask you to do something we haven't done. We have a very big internet business. Um, it, it, it's a great business in baseball. It's even bigger business in the streaming area where we provide streaming services for everything from WWE to ESPN to HBO Go. I mean, those are all powered by our technology at MLB.com. So we like that technology lots. You know, it's done a lot for us. But he said to me, we can't do that in China, okay? There are two players um, in the streaming field. We have to be a partner with one of them. And we have to be streaming games. We have to be streaming games in Mandarin. We have to have a portal um, that provides information on our 30 teams. It has to be in Mandarin. And we have to have products I'll tell you a funny story about this last piece. We have to have products that are appropriate for the culture in China. Um, and so we announced at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago a partnership with a, a company called LitTV. Um, they do everything from make cars to provide cloud services and build smart smartphones and stream. They're going to stream 96 games in Mandarin in China, uh, regular season and all of our postseason. Um, they're going to uh, build a portal um, where you'll have access to information on all 30 teams in Mandarin. And they will have a shop that, um, again, sells products that are tailored to the Chinese market. When this young man that I was talking about presented this China strategy to the um, owners, the way he made his localization point was this. He, he put up the top of two heads. And he explained that the head on the right is the normal Caucasian head, and the head on the left is the normal Asian head, and he says, if you think you can sell the same hats to those two heads, you're wrong. <laughs> so, um, you know, so that's an example of, uh, of what we're doing in, in China. Mexico, um, Mexico's a different approach. Mexico is another place you spend a lot of time and money. We feel there the key is Mexican players in the big leagues. They're at a different state of development and we just need more Mexican professionals and, you know, with an eye towards, we'd like to play every day in Mexico at some point. Um, there are a lot of hands and I can't see them all, but I wanted to mix it up. Are there any young women who have a question? <laughs> is way there, in the one? Back. there, there is yeah, one in the, in the back there. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Ishan Shen, Yankee fan. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm also an advisor in the Office of Career Services, and I would like to know for all the students here if you have any advice on how people in this audience might someday find themselves in your position. Yeah. Um, you know, I get asked this question all the time, and you know, a, a lot of what happens to you is a product of you know, where you are, how things happen to break for you, who you know, you know, who you get to meet and, you know, who takes a liking to you. Um, but I think the most important um, piece of advice with respect to sports is this. It's really hard to enter sports at an entry level and let me become the commissioner of baseball or the general counsel of the Red Sox, you know, I, I, either one. Um, I think that um, the, the reason for that, particularly with lawyers, is that we don't have a broad enough, big enough practice to train young lawyers. That's why I said earlier, you know, I, I don't hire people fresh out of law school. I want people who have been through, you know, a big firm or a firm experience. They've been trained and, you know, are then ready to work for us. But the, I think the point with respect to that and lawyers applies generally. Most important thing about getting started in sports is being good at something. 
Sports is not a substantive area of expertise. It's an industry. You know, you have to be good at something and bring that to the table to get started in sports. So the best advice that, or what, the advice I try to give people is get good. Uh, develop your own talents as whatever you are, a lawyer, a marketing person, whatever, and then begin to network in sports and you enter at a level that really usually um, gives you an opportunity to go further um, in the industry. Um, right next to you in the, in the middle there. Yeah. Uh, my name's Kyle, a Red Sox fan. Uh, you talked earlier about young people's interest in the game. And I was just curious if you think that uh, pace of play and length of game is an issue? Oh, yeah. Yeah, pace of play and length of game, which are actually different issues, but related, obviously, are, are huge issues. Um, look, our game um, has to continue to evolve to be consonant with the way that people live their lives. And um, one of the reasons I take exception to, you know, people talk about our television ratings, for example. Um, you know, it may not be over the long haul that television is the predominant way that people engage with baseball. Seven million people um, with an average age of 30 open at bat every day during the season, okay? And why is that? It's because it gives them an opportunity to engage in our game that is more consonant with the way they live their life. They don't have to devote three hours. They can get on, see what's going on, do something else, come back, whatever. Um, same thing within market streaming, which is an issue you know we've wrestled halfway to the ground. I'm pretty confident that David's going to tell me he's number 16, so we'll have 16 teams that are going to stream. Um, but. Um, <laughs> You know, people need to be able to take their phone out and see a broadcast of a Red Sox game or a Yankee game on their phone in the market if that's what they want to do. And so, um, it, you know, length is a big issue. Um, we're working very hard. We worked very hard last year on pace of game, length of game. We're going to have a whole other set of initiatives that we're going to deploy this year. But I think equally important, we need to use technology to deliver our game to people, give people the opportunity to engage in our game, with our game, in a way that they're comfortable with, given the way the world has changed. Um, over here in the, yeah. Hi, uh, David Kimball Stanley, also a Yankees fan. Uh, I just sort of similar to what you were just talking about. I was wondering, uh, offense is down, and uh, there's been a lot of talk about different changes to the game to deal with that. I was wondering what your thoughts are on what's most likely. Well, uh, let me give you a little, because I am a data guy. Our offense actually went up the second half of the season for the first time in five years. Um, we're not quite sure why. Um, you know, things ebb and flow in this game, but we did have an uptick. We watch, uh, and, and you know, look, th there is an ebb and flow to the game. Pitchers become dominant, hitters adjust, and y what you don't want to do is, you know, rush out there and make changes to a game where history and tradition is very important. Um, when you are in a cycle that may just be self-correcting. Um, having said that, um, you know, technology is also important here. Um, you know, the strike zone um, was traditionally defined kneecap to the letters, right? They, then they started talking about the hollow of the knee. And why did they do that? Well, they weren't calling um, a low strike. And we tried to encourage, we were encouraging umpires to do that. Well, then what happens is we developed a system where um, every pitch is graded electronically and the umpire has to sit down and watch the ones he misses after the game, okay? So they see that they're not calling this low pitch, okay? And, you know, the hollow of the knee is the rule. And then some of the old guys start to retire, right? And some of the newer guys come on and their whole career, they're subject to this technological correction. So all of a sudden now we have a strike zone that's moved down, okay? They're, they're calling it right based on what the rule is, okay? But this manual adjustment we, we made with the hollow of the knee has driven the strike zone down over time. So we are looking, and you know, low, a low strike is a tough 
pitch to hit, obviously. So we are looking at that issue, and we think we may have technologied ourselves into a bit of a problem. So we're, we're, we are looking at that issue. So we have time for one or at most two. Um, how about the young woman up here? Hi, my name is Laura Lynn, a uh, Los Angeles Dodgers fan. All right. <laughs> I thought it was only Yankee and Red Sox That's fans. That's what I thought, too. Yeah, the Reds guy, <clears throat> right? Yeah. Um, and so we've touched a lot on quite a few issues um, that you're addressing in baseball. And I just wanted to know what do you think is the most pressing and what are the immediate steps that you're taking to address it? Yeah, look, I, there's no question um, that the issue that we identified at the, the beginning of my tenure as the most important was the youth initiative. Um, we think it's about the future of the game, and uh, it's why we have placed so much emphasis and devoted so much time um, programmatically to um, trying to encourage young people not only to play, but to get into the ballpark. Um, I think the second one, I'll give you, the, since I talked so much about that one, I think this, the, the, the second one is a related topic, and it is technology. Um, you know, I think it is crucial for baseball um, to use technology as the bridge between preserving the history and traditions of the game and keeping the game relevant in a society that's changing very rapidly. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that um, we have such a huge technology business really set, you know that almost as a separate it will be in about a week a separate company from baseball um it, it is that i think the owners see that same priority it is the key to our future so automated strike zones or not it's interesting um it, that is a play i don't utter these words very much that is a place where technology is wanting um the the little boxes that Nesson puts up there. They're really not very accurate. Um, the, not, not just Nesson, anybody. Um, um, you know, it's like false precision. We're showing you where the pitch is. Um, the system, that, and I'll tell you what I mean by the technology being wanted, the, the tracking of the pitch is perfect. I mean, we know how to do that, and, and the technology is really outstanding. The problem is what we do literally in evaluating the umpire is for each batter, somebody goes in manually and adjusts the strike zone to that batter. What you see on TV is just a standard box. If the guy's 6'6 six, six, and 5'6, it's the same damn box, okay? Which obviously, you know, is, is not correct. So we have that one manual piece that we haven't quite figured out yet. Um, and, you know, uh, maybe someday, uh, maybe someday. I promised people at one o'clock classes we'd start at, we'd stop at 12.50. Uh, please join me in thanking the commissioner. That was great, thank you very much.